Hello and welcome. Even as Delhi hosted the fourth BRICS summit, Tibetans across the country protested vociferously the visit of Chinese President Hu Jintao. And a 27-year-old man, Jampel Ishe, immolated himself. Doing what similar acts have done in the past, and that is focus attention back on the over 50-year-old Tibetan struggle for autonomy. So what does an act like this actually achieve besides a fresh burst of media oxygen for the cause? And where does the Tibetan struggle find itself today? To answer those complex questions, my guest today is the Prime Minister of the Tibetan Administration in Exile, Dr. Lobsang Sangye. Dr. Sangye, it's good to have you on this show. My first question is a rather tough question and that is, what has the death of Jampel Yeshi achieved for the Tibetan struggle because it was a sacrifice, literally. Uh, thank you for inviting me to your show, Anuradhaji. Um, the sacrifice of Jampal Yeshe has brought, in some ways, the face and the agony and the tragedy to the uh, 33 self immolators who uh, tried in Tibet and 22 of them have died. Unfortunately, for some time, uh, I fear, and I've expressed this few times, that the self-immolators in Tibet, even though some say in one community is the largest in the entire world, was almost becoming a number. The 30 have self-immolated, 31, 32, and I often said this is, this is not number. They are human beings like you and me who wants to live their life. Life is precious, given a choice we want to live. But when Champal Yishe and his tragic, really heart-wrenching sacrifice was caught in so many frames, in so many pictures and videos, as sad and as unfortunate in the graphic the pictures were, it brought the agony, the pain the one go through self-immolation. But Dr. Sangye, many would say that as the political leader of this, you know, of the Tibetan diaspora, and you would claim of the Tibetan people in total, uh, that in this small community outside Tibet, small and close-knit community, uh, maybe you and the political leadership could do more to prevent such drastic action. Because while the Dalai Lama and while you have uh, s have said often enough that you discourage such, such drastic action, there seems to be you know tacit acceptance that this will happen because it helps spotlight attention. Would you agree to this charge that you could do more to counsel youngsters against taking this route? I absolutely don't agree with the charge mm -hmm. for following reasons. Mm -hmm. um, number one. We have issued statements after statements and directives to any organization or individual who wants to organize or participate in any political activities. It has to be legal, peaceful, and with dignity. That we have issued from the very beginning. Self-immolation specifically, we have never encouraged. And on January 26, we have said specifically, please, refrain from extreme measures. When we issue directives like that, people do listen. And then when Jampal Yishe, when he self immolated immediately thereafter, the next day or two, we issued another directive saying, please refrain from extreme measures. Because as a human being, you really don't want to see anyone die. But as a Buddhist, mm -hmm. when someone passes away, you pray for them, like Hindus do, or Muslims do. And then, as a Tibetan, when Jambal Yishe and others, they died for Tibet and Tibetan people, for us, you show solidarity and make sure their voices are heard and highlighted so that their lives lost do not go in vain. So we have a complex role. Since 2008, there has been a history of immolations that have happened, especially inside Tibet. Uh, and I've heard both you and His Holiness the Dalai Lama express quite categorically that the responsibility for this as well as the solution to prevent this should come from China. 
why use the same route to protest in India and especially when you say that you have given out a directive not just that you're against it but that you've given people a directive not to do it then how do you explain it now there are two attempts one in Delhi before and Jambali Shilla passed away yes even directives is not making impact at least to few because the sufferings inside Tibet is so high so painful and one after another when it, when they start self emulating and hundreds get arrested how many get tortured when you keep hearing this news on a daily basis as a human being it takes its toll even me I, it's been eight months the 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 most taxing uh, the psychological impactful news that you get is about self-immolation. You hear someone passed away, you don't know the name, in a day or two you know the name, then their parents, and you always think, you know, how he or she must have thought through this. And then how the parents and relatives must be thinking, their family members and friends must be thinking, must be having a very painful uh, and complex feelings actually. And then you can clearly see the motivation is for Tibet and Tibetan people. In the month of November is very important. When self-immolation started, uh, six, seven, eight at that time, I went to the U.S., appealed to the senators and congressmen to show support, and thankfully the State Department, including Hillary Clinton, uh, also issued statements. There was only one self-immolation on November 3rd or 4th. Then I went to Europe, seven countries in 11 or 12 days. And each country actually uh, kind of issued statement or statement of concerns that throughout my trip, no self-immolation in Tibet. And I thought, perhaps it's working. I'm sending them a message of hope that their international community cares. They support you. Listen to them. If you give them hope, I thought they might, you know, uh, not self-immolate. But in early December, the so first or second when I was in London, I heard one more Tibetan self-immolate. It just kind of deflated me. I thought, oh, um, this is not an act of hopelessness. This is not just an act of desperation. This is a political act on their part. It's a conscious act on their part. Given that it is difficult to go to Tibet, you have never been allowed to visit Tibet. In fact, you haven't seen Tibet because you were born here in India. Um, how are the, what, what is the level of communication and exchange of um, information between local Tibetans and the diaspora because you have more than uh, 4 million, 5 million people, lit uh, Tibetans inside Tibet and uh, just about a hundred thousand spread across the world and majority here in India, isn't it? Yeah, 90 plus percent, 95 percent are inside mm. and uh, but thousands of Tibetans have fled Tibet since 1980s. Mm. Can you imagine uh, someone as young as 6 to 60 years crossing over Himalayan mountains, giving up everybody and parents also letting them go to come to India for education and they have grown up here. So thousands of them are here, they have, their relatives are also back home. So it seems now through uh, cell phones, you know, uh, Vodafone, which, whichever gives cheap rate, they call each other on a daily basis. Thousands from abroad, Tibetans, talk to Tibetans inside on a daily basis and there are three uh, radio programs. Voice of America, Radio Free Asia, and Voice of Tibet. They are widely listened to, and then there is a uh, television. And our administration, Dharamsala, also has Tibet Online TV, mm -hmm. which are being watched. Uh, I came to know about it during the election of the Kalun Tripa last year, mm -hmm. uh, for whole of a year, the talk of the town, so to speak. Were the elections? Yes, was about the election. And Tibet Inside Tibet knew, mm -hmm. because I have seen some songs composed by artists inside Tibet. Some of them got arrested also. Mm -hmm called three lions because we have two lions in the national flag yes. and my second name is lion mm -hmm. so three lions and the latest song is called actually uh, our prime minister Lopsang Senge you know or Kalun Triple Lopsang Senge so you believe that that there is support and there is legitimacy that your leadership has even amongst Tibetans inside Tibet absolutely absolutely because um, this January, mm -hmm. 10,000 Tibetans from Tibet came through various means to uh, Bodh Gaya yes. for the Kala Chakra teaching. Yes. And I met hundreds of them actually. They came to my office in Dharamsala also. Mm -hmm. When you meet, they knew my name, knew my face, immediately, very emotional, tears rolling. 
and then we just it just become very emotional conversation and they all say I did not know much to say they say look you know you are hope do the best you can let's talk about managing the diaspora especially here in India um, it must be difficult to uh, keep a community together especially when more and more uh, you know the new the people who are born here have never seen Tibet have never gone there they can have routine ordinary lives in India or in any other part of the world um, you know more more or less like anybody else I think what I'm trying to get at is how core or integral is the Tibetan cause and the struggle to a contemporary young Tibetan's identity Yes, that's a very important question because not many people you know, see this, they just see Tibet issue in general. But on a daily basis, the, the, one of the main jobs of the administration is to you know, make our movement effective, give our, uh, our cause, our values, our identity, our culture alive. Um, then obviously keep the issue alive in the international forum and press the Chinese government to solve the issue of Tibet. One that what we have to do domestically is very important. That's on a daily basis. So we appeal to Tibetans and also give directives. And when we visit, meet Tibetans, we always say, you know, be conscious. The most important thing is to have Tibetan consciousness. That you are Tibetan, you should be proud of yourself. That yes, you don't, we don't have our own homeland. It is under occupation, but one should be proud that you are a Tibetan of great civilization great culture, great moral authority, and great leader uh, in, the, in, in His Holiness Dalai Lama for all these years. So we really take pride. Every Wednesday we have mm. appealed to elders yes. to pray in the, for all those who have died, and the younger Tibetans mm. to eat, uh, think, and dress Tibetan. Mm. And then, you know, the younger generation are getting very excited. Mm. And I have heard stories of, you know, a mother uh, being woken up by young children you know, early in the morning saying it's Wednesday I have to wear my Tibetan dress today so that I can go to school and announce and declare that I am a Tibetan and this is my Tibetan dress and this is what I represent even if they are, if they are, of, chi they are of children of intermarriages you know there is this Tibetan consciousness the pride that we have and we, see, we, we really do have this pride and, and then we have our education system uh, we have 60 plus uh, primary, middle and high schools through which we teach them everything in Tibetan up to primary school and bilingual in the middle school and in, in English in high school because now you have to enter Indian universities because I also went to yes. Delhi University, English is important. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we have rebuilt and replicated most of the major monasteries in Tibet mm -hmm. that the Chinese destroyed. Mm -hmm. So thousands of monks, of modern education plus monastic education are coming up and really brilliant lamas are also coming up so in, a, in, in many sense I say our, our future is much brighter You sound and you are very hopeful and optimistic about the Tibetan struggle that you're leading politically today and yet ever since you were elected Prime Minister last year I think you spent uh, the last year uh, defending the fact that Tibet is not a lost cause and uh, you know this comes di stems directly from the rise of China's economic might and the fact that everybody is doing business with China what are two or three things that you've seen in the past year specifically that give you hope I think the answer is really easy actually I've talked to an Estonian from the Baltic states and I asked uh, in late 80s just before they got their freedom. Did you really think that you, you would be free from Soviet Union? And she said, in our head, no, but in our heart, yes. As far as Tibetans are concerned, in our heart, we always believed and continue to believe that we will regain our freedom, no doubt about it. In our head also, why? Aung San Suu Kyi, just a few months ago, she was under house arrest. She fought the election, she swept the 44 seats uh, that was, you know, uh, contested. An Arab Spring, just a year ago, who would have thought that the Hosni Mubarak will be removed and Gaddafi will be no more or Ben Ali of Tunisia will be no more, you see? 
It just happened in one year. But all these uh, countries and all the, you know, all the struggles, people's struggles internally there have taken attention away from Tibet's cause, would you agree? While it would give you hope, it would also mean that media attention, which is so vital to keeping causes like yours alive, has been diverted, hasn't it? Yes and no. Mm. Yes, in the sense media and the international community uh, was and continue, continue to be focused on uh, Arab countries. Mm. But, you know, we don't complain because this is the positive direction of the world. The history is bending towards justice and we are for it. We've been rooting for the people in Arab countries, for their freedom and for their democracy because, you know, uni freedom is universal. Everybody ought to have it, including, including us. So we've been rooting for them. Um, no, in the sense, you know, ultimately you have to keep the issue alive yourself. And we do believe in the last 50 years, as you pointed out, Anuradhaji, mm -hmm. I have not seen Tibet because I was not allowed to, mm -hmm. but I absolutely believe that you will and I'm uh, And I am proud that I'm a Tibetan and I'll die as one. While I live, I'll work for Tibet. And I will visit Tibet in my lifetime, no doubt about it. The Tibetan administration in exile and the Dalai Lama who um, practice peaceful methods using dialogue to have a dialogue, you don't have anyone to dialogue with because the Chinese government is not open or available to dialogue with you and I have made statements, several statements. How then do you feel so confident of a future where you're not even at a table having discussions? You know, the Chinese government has called His Holiness many names. Yes, yes. Including demon and like yeah, that. Yeah. But they had to talk with him mm. or his representatives mm, mm. from 2002 to 2010. Mm. So, you know, um, they will say things actually. It's part of politics. Mm. But I do believe without having dialogue, and not solving the issue of Tibet is harmful to China. China's future. Yes, China and China's future. Because on the one hand, they say, we are peacefully rising, this is our foreign policy. If there is no peace in Tibet, how can you uh, justify and people believe that there is China is really rising peacefully? And they say, we have harmonious society. Harmony is what we emphasize domestically. And they blame you for all the emulations. And then, and and then they start shooting at Tibetans and killing them. Then how come there is, uh, uh, there is harmony? And then, instead of accepting the blame, they, they just play this blame game and they started you know, pointing fingers at us. And it's laughable. I mean, who will believe that we are responsible for what's going on inside Tibet? For 50 years, there has been protests inside Tibet because of the occupation and repression. And there will be protests because if the repression continues, there will be resentment. And that's what Gandhiji did. That, that's what Nelson Mandela did. That's what Aung San Suu Kyi did. This is what we will do also. And no one would believe. You just mentioned that there have been meetings bet, uh, you know, between the Dalai Lama's representatives and representatives of the Chinese government. I know you have worked at creating dialogue between Chinese scholars and students in, in, you know, in, a, in a neutral place like, the Amer like America. Do you believe that the Chinese people support your cause? I think so, because mm. when I first started these conferences mm. at Harvard, mm between Chinese and Tibetan scholars. Mm. No one, not many people believed me, including my professors at Harvard mm. Law School. Mm. They said, Lopsang, are you sure the Chinese will come mm. from what we, read, what mm. we read? I don't think there's any chance, and especially you, you are an exiled Tibetan. Mm. I said, this is what I believe. I want to start. Not many Tibetans also believed, but I started it. Mm. And then we have conferences after mm. conferences between Chinese from mainland China mm. and uh, exiled Tibetan scholars and uh, professors and experts from around the world, including from Delhi and Europe uh, and America. So when no one believed, in a small way, I've proven that we could have dialogue with Chinese students and scholars. Similarly, and I have 16 years of track record, mm -hmm. so Chinese government blaming me that I don't, I don't believe in dialogue, they will not participate and in dialogue. And alluding to your past, isn't it? Yes. When you were part of the more yes. aggressive uh, Tibetan Youth Congress. That's true. And then, you know, uh, 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 mm. it, I believed in dialogue and have, I've demonstrated in the last mm. 16 years mm. and all those Chinese students and scholars who know me, mm. they also believe where I stand. So it's only Chinese government who is just trying to, you know, uh, fool the world but it's not going to work.
given the current scenario there is no reason or no doubt that you have that this middle way this middle path where where you're uh, asking for autonomy within the chinese constitution or under the auspices of the chinese constitution and its laws there is no doubt in your mind that this is the right approach middle way has been a long term view of his holiness dalai lama mm. and this it is, is something that you have personally had to uh, it's not something you accepted as a young man isn't it is it that's something that you personally have had to come to accept mm -hmm. out of your own uh, yes. uh, study and growth yes explain to me what makes you believe in it now milwe uh, is also the policy based mm -hmm. on the uh, three resolutions mm -hmm. passed by the tibetan parliament mm -hmm. and when i ran Uh, in the election i also ran on the platform of the middle way so while while at harvard law school initially as you pointed out i was this firebrand you know activist who who organized the largest protest when chinese president cheng zemin came to harvard we had a huge yes. protest and after that i started interacting with many chinese students and scholars and men i met many who are willing to listen and have dialogue and understand and supportive of tibet and i said oh if these are the chinese people uh, uh who will come to leadership who if if they come to leadership position then uh, perhaps it's worth engaging in so that's how my dialogue started then i also started reading about you know obviously i read before but quite extensively about non violent movements not mahatma gandhi ji nelson mandela and others most of the if not all the non violent movements who have succeeded have had dialogue with the other side So I thought if it has worked before then it should work for us as well. Is it also because you would not have got the blessings of the Dalai Lama uh if you hadn't seen things in this way isn't it? No actually before the election he didn't say a word mm. as to who he prefer among the three remaining candidates. Mm. Had he said a word that could have made one of our you know life lot easier then we could have swept the election he didn't he certainly just didn't say a word he let you work hard it has let, let us work very hard mm -hmm. after the election he has come out mm -hmm. and you know uh has said oh you know uh the uh, his solemnness has full faith in me and i'm doing the right thing i sometimes i always wish his solemnness should have said this one month prior to the election <laughs> you know, to work a little then i don't hard, have to it? travel yes. because you know when i travel from one settlement to another mm -hmm. settlement i had to i had to take 22 hours taxi ride mm -hmm. and you know uh, go to many many places 7 8 10 hours of taxis was a common thing to do and uh, I, i i know it could have saved some time <laughs> and energy yes you have four more years in this term yes and um, four years and four months four years and four months i'm counting <laughs> in this term i can yes. see that it seems to be very clear to people outside that uh, the dalai lama is the glue that binds the tibetans whether it is his you know his personality whether it is his spiritual eminence whether it is the fact that the world has recognized his um you know his moral authority he last year said that when he was 90 he's going to decide whether or not there should be a reincarnation whether whether or not there whether the tibetans need another dalai lama now as far as next or the 15th dalai lama is concerned his solemnness has put three things on the table reincarnation which is normal someone passes away then you recognize a boy most likely boy or it could be a girl mm -hmm. as the next reincarnation emination meaning his solemnness could designate his successor while he's alive right, right. or selection where a group of high lamas from all the tibetan buddhist world could come and select the next dalai lama so it could be any of these three forms so but it's pretty clear and he has said at the age of 90 and i always wonder why he why he was so specific because who knows how long one lived but he was his solemnness was so certain and he's what 76 77 now yes i yeah. think a couple of reasons he said 90 number 1 I think journalists keep asking him so when you pass away who will succeed you and <laughs> yes, when you I get this question on a daily basis he <laughs> say you know what let me postpone it till the age of 90 so <laughs> now that is postponed yes secondarily mm. i think uh, you mm. know he wants to give space to the political incarnation first he has transferred his political power he wants to give space to the political incarnation from where he is and mm. from where the political leader is is nowhere right. so give them space let him grow raise profile mm. mature mm. and make it more stable and consolidate mm. it mm. then 
mm -hmm. uh, decide on the spiritual uh, incarnation. You know? mm -hmm. So that uh, Chinese government all along they thought when His Holiness the Dalai Lama will be no more, we will solve the issue of Tibet. Mm -hmm. you know? That issue of Tibet will be solved automatically. Mm -hmm. That is, is not going to happen. Right. Now they have to deal with so two. So these steps, yes. 15 Dalai Lama hmm. and a political leader, or two at a time. And His Holiness Dalai himself, the Chinese government, hmm. and it, all the Buddhist leaders of also agreed hmm. that they have no role whatsoever in selecting the next Dalai Lama. You were born in India, you have uh, lived uh, most of your early life in India, and you live in India today. Um, you have therefore articulated better than anyone else the sense of gratitude uh, you feel for India. Having said that, do you feel India needs to do more to support your cause? You know, we are speaking just after the BRICS summit. We saw, um, you know, we've already discussed Jampal Yeshe's uh, self-immolation. Uh, we saw the police crackdown, uh, preventive arrests, Tibetan colonies getting extra security. What more do you think India can do and what would you like to say to Indians who are beginning to feel yes we love the Tibetans but you know what we don't need another problem. India has done the most for Tibetans bare none really. Our administration is here largest number of Tibetans are here so what can Tibetan complain? Now during the BRICS summit you mentioned uh, there was some, some news account said there was a crackdown and some Tibetans were arrested, put behind bars, things like that. I've, I've experienced that myself. When I was in Delhi yeah. University, yeah. I've been yes. in front of one Chinese of those embassy, people. one of those people who got few lattes, mm -hmm. uh, who have been to Chennai Kepuri police station, things like that. No complaints, really. I don't have even a single bit of, you know, hard uh, uh, feelings uh, towards those Indian policemen who did what they had to do. We were doing our job, they were, do, they were doing their job. So all the Tibetans who uh, got arrested or beaten up, maybe handled uh, roughly. But, you know, for us, India has done so much, no complaints at all. At that time, we might get some emotion, we might say some things. But, but more expectations of what it could do? Human desire has no limit. Yes. If India mm -hmm. uh, does something more for Tibet and Tibetan people, we will welcome it. If India speaks, people around the world will listen. If they speak about Aung San Suu Kyi, if they speak about India, if, if they speak about Tibet and Tibetan people, the world will listen. So if, in, if India and Indian people does it, all the better. If not, we have no complaints. And some Indians who are saying, well, we don't need another problem. Please don't say that. Why? Because this is the land of Gandhiji. You see, Gandhiji and the non-violent movement, the Ahimsa, mm -hmm is so popular and accepted around the world and think many people think this is the way to move forward and tibetans have invested in ahimsa in democracy two core principles of tibetan people are based on indian ethos and indian principles so we are just so we can't abandon we can't abandon people who have learned from us is that this what is, you're saying this <laughs> is like chela you know looking at guru guru you 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 taught us this and we are just following your teaching mm. and uh, uh, well, do do uh, we, we we would request that you know uh, uh, the guru uh, will uh, just pat on us from time to time. And they have been doing a great job all for all these years. Dr. Sange, you have four years and four months to, to, go. to consolidate, not to go, to consolidate the political leadership of the Tibetan people, whether it's you or whoever comes after you. We wish you all the very best and thank you very much for giving us time. Thank you. Thank you.